This is the Seminole Wars Authority. Hello and welcome. We continue our discussion with new recruits to the Seminole War living history hobby. Marcus Acosta is a buddy of Ethan Parks, last week's guest. The two portray Army privates of the 1830s and have fought and died together on the reenactment stage, but all for a good cause. That cause is honoring the people who fought and some who perished on these Florida battle sites of the Seminole Wars era. Both do this through service, representing young soldiers, thereby raising awareness of the humanity of the participants back in those days. They present a neglected history to the public. In this episode, Marcus gives us his impression on the importance of what he does. Marcus Acosta, welcome to the Seminole Wars Authority. Glad to be here. All right, Marcus, tell us what you're doing. I'm a youth reenactor with 3rd Artillery, Company B, 4th Squad. Myself and my buddy Ethan Parks got involved with living history at around the same time when we developed our impressions together. Uh, both of us are also members of Dade's Youth, which is the youth wing of the Dade Battlefield Society. Very good. So why are you doing this? I have a very deep passion for history. I have always loved reading history books, and I wanted to take my passion a step further. And I grew to realize just how unknown this time period is and how important it is to teach the public about it. What got you interested in this particularly? I live right next to Fort Cooper here in Inverness. I didn't grow up here. I used to live in Riverview, and there's not much to do in Riverview, but I joined the Florida Frontiersmen as a prospective member, which isn't really a reenactment group, but it was my introduction to the fringe of reenactment. I grew to enjoy firing uh, flintlock rifles there, although I never owned one. So our most important question, are you having fun with this? I just love doing it. I have a lot of fun doing it. I really enjoy learning about the era, but I also have to say I enjoy the whole reenactor experience as well. I had a great time last day battle, which was my first time in a period camp, so I highly recommend it to anyone who loves history. What took place at the campfire? Well, it was a soldier's camp. It had your standard A-frame tent. Uh, I got a little bit far beyond the inside. I wasn't a period correct tent. But I just loved the experience of actually being in a tent, even with all of my modern conveniences. And I really can't wait until the next event where I get to do it again. Contrast your experience with what you think the soldiers would have experienced. That was a very cold day battle, and I was absolutely freezing, even though I had all this modern cold weather gear. And I was just thinking about just how miserable it must have been to only have a great coat and a jacket and maybe a blanket camping in that sort of weather, especially since they would have had to put up with rain. They would not have had sleeping bags or cots. It would have just been miserable and hard for them. And what did they talk about at this campfire? I've noticed reenactors tend to discuss all sorts of things. I have learned more about the Civil War and World War II and even World War I, and just much I've learned about the Seminole Wars around the campfire. But all sorts of things are discussed. I've learned new skills around the campfire, flip napping, for example. So to me, sitting around the campfire and just chewing the fat is really part of the whole experience, and I love doing it. You weren't initially keen on the area of Inverness. What caused you to take a more favorable impression? I moved here to Inverness, and I was a little bit upset because I figured there wouldn't be anything to do here. By that time, I had heard of Dade Battlefield because I had researched the area, but not really. And I figured Dade Battlefield was just going to be another Civil War skirmish, and I'm not particularly interested in the Civil War compared to most people. So I was a little bit disappointed with the area at first. But my grandmother showed me a picture of all these guys, and they were wearing what looked to me almost Napoleonic uniforms. So I looked into it, and I became very interested. And a couple of days later, I wrote an email to the park rangers at Dade Battlefield State Park, and they put me in contact with a Mr. Archie Marshall, and we exchanged a couple of emails before I was invited to a Dade Battlefield Society meeting where we met in person. Once you decided to do this and became accepted among the group, how did you get yourself outfitted? 
Well, it was very interesting meeting him. Uh, I know he's been on this podcast several times, and he is just as knowledgeable in person as he is for a prepared interview. And uh, we coordinated, and I was invited to a living history as a spectator. And I listened to him give his whole little talk. And uh, then we got together and we started discussing uh, the making of a uniform. Uh, and that was a very daunting challenge for me at first. Uh, I had never sewn anything before. But my grandfather wanted to teach himself how to sew before I ever got involved. So this was sort of an outlet for him to test his skills. Uh, himself and I worked on this uniform. And we did that for several months until I finally got it done. And I'm very glad I did that. That's really part of the whole experience is making your own uniform and not just buying one, although I know a lot of people do buy them. How hard was it to adjust and get accepted among the group? There is a very tight-knit network. There's not a very large network, but it's very tight-knit. The most help I got was obviously from Mr. Marshall. He's the resident expert on that. But I received help from others, too. I bought some of my equipment from others. It is challenging to get into this particular obscure era. There's a lot that has to be discovered for yourself, and it's not readily available online. We have to make do with what we've got. But in the end, it's definitely worth it. How did you prepare yourself for this? Well, during... The uh, initial phase where I was making my uniform, I attended almost every around monthly living history that Mr. Marshall puts on at the state park. And most of the time I was just a spectator, but before the real spectators arrived, myself and Ethan, we'd drill. We'd uh, be loaned muskets and we'd march around and we'd drill. And we'd be given history lessons as we drilled, you know, we We'd be told our faces, and then we'd be told to do a wheel, and we'd get history lessons as we did all this. And I read books during this whole period. I, I read almost constantly. I am a voracious reader at all times, and so I focus all my attention on reading these books. I've read Massacre by Frank Warmer. I've read Dade's Last Command. And I also just got to The Florida War, which is the book that was a very long read, very difficult read with a lot of very dense information, but I got through it, and uh, that has really helped me advance my impression actually reading these documents that people wrote. Do you find your youth to be an advantage or a disadvantage or some combination? 99% of the time, it's an advantage. I've been told, and I'm really the exact age that most of them would have been, uh, especially considering that it was pretty common for teenagers to run away and join the army at my age. You know, they lie about a difference of a few years. I try and portray that. When I do a first-person impression, I try and portray that I ran away from home to join the army where I thought it would be better. So most of the time it's an advantage, and a lot of people seem to be very interested in the fact that these very young people would actually join the army and go to war. But I do have to say that sometimes it has been a disadvantage. There are certain state park rules that are difficult for me to get around, including a new sort of catch-22. I'm over 16, which means I'm allowed to carry and fire a black powder firearm, but I'm not allowed to draw a powder ration because I'm under 21. So this has created a catch-22 where it's difficult for me to get my own powder, especially since... I can't bring my own powder to state park events. I've managed to get a workaround to that for now, so I do hope that someone up at the state level takes notice of this, because if there aren't more young people getting involved, the hobby is really going to decline. How important is a mentorship in this? It's very important. I wouldn't be where I am without it. I talk about Mr. Marshall a lot because he's the one I spend most of my time around. He's the main mentor of fourth squad which is mostly the youth squad although there's a couple of older guys in it but i've received mentorship from many many different people i've learned a lot of things from a lot of people some of it's not even related to some of the wars as i learn about it i've seen a demonstration on flint napping for example by a mr kent Lowe, and many others have shown me things little things all the time in betraying a soldier of the time you stay in your impression all the time. And is it necessary? Mostly in the Civil War, I've heard some people maintain a constant in-person experience. 
I don't do that for the most part. I maintain third person, which is uh, I don't try and pretend I'm actually in character unless I'm in a battle. Although I have had certain experiences where I do portray a first person character, usually with Mr. Steve Rink, who's the president of the Seminole Wars Foundation. He and I on multiple occasions have been asked to do a first person impression together. And I usually try and play off him. I'm not particularly good at it just yet. So I let him do most of the talking and I respond when he asks me to. I don't see any problem with that. Some people would complain that they don't get to talk enough, but I don't mind. I recognize that I'm new and I need to learn a little bit from more experienced people. Marcus, do you feel accepted within this community now? Everybody is just super friendly to each other when they're not in character. Personally, I think it adds to the experience. I'd like us to get someone who's an early army sergeant with no offense meant to the current sergeants. They are excellent sergeants. So parents need not get too concerned about their teenagers running off to join the army and all that traditionally represents. So nobody should be afraid of that. There's nobody there who takes it too seriously and even if they do they only do it in character and there's a very clear distinction between in character and out of character you're going out and doing an impression of this soldier's life have you had an opportunity to try the rations that they had on the march i haven't had the pleasure to have that yet where we make our rations i know a uh, a mr dennis i believe uh, he and his wife they have a uh, display of soldiers rations i haven't tried any yet well, I did, actually. I was given some hardtack, and I tried that, and it really wasn't that bad. I've read horror stories about it in the past. I'm a very avid scholar of the Napoleonic era, especially the Navy of that era. I read a lot, and they complain about it. But to me, it wasn't that bad. One day, I would like to see if somebody would actually do that and have salt pork and hardtack ration or some kind of stew made out of period-correct ingredients for an event. I think that would be very interesting. I learned from Paulette Dennis, who consulted Jerry Morris's booklet, An Army Moves on Its Stomach, for information that she presents, that the ration of vinegar served a twofold purpose. One was against the scurvy, but the other was against the gas that the beans in the rations tend to aggravate. Well, people have been drinking vinegar since the time of the Romans. They would take their sour wine, you know, the original vinegar would have been uh, red wine vinegar, and they mixed that with water to make a beverage. And this beverage was not particularly pleasant tasting, but it turns out that it would have a lot of electrolytes in it. So it was sort of an ancient Gatorade. What person or thing do you find most inspirational from the story of the Seminole Wars? I would say the most inspirational thing, in a way, would be the Seminoles themselves, the way they conducted themselves during the war, the way they never officially surrendered. To me, that's always stood out. With other European wars and even with other Indian wars, there's always been a surrender at the end or some sort of disastrous defeat, but there never was that. They just petered out, but they never really surrendered. There were always still a couple left. There were always still a couple here. And to me, that's very inspirational. But also, in a way, I find it inspirational the way the soldiers fought. It's one thing to fight for what you believe in, but it's also another thing to fight for something you don't believe in, to really have the courage to just fight in those desolate conditions that the soldiers did against an enemy that they essentially knew they couldn't win again. And it takes a lot of guts to be able to do that. It's a very difficult thing to do, to fight against what even they saw as a righteous cause. Marcus, you bring up excellent points about what the soldier's mindset might have been supporting the war effort or not believing in it, but still doing their duty. One of the things I've been pleased to see is that the living history impressionists aren't there to refight the war and maybe win it this time. They're content with their attempt to present it as it happened, as it was. What's been your experience? The same question has come up with Civil War reenactors. That's a very charged issue, but I have been to Civil War reenactments before, and I even participated in one. I'm still not particularly interested in the Civil War, but I did participate in one. And I found out, and I've been told, that they switch sides constantly. Nobody just plays Confederate, and nobody just plays Federal. 
And the same thing happens with the Seminole Wars. It's really about the love of portraying history, not one particular side. They do switch sides, and a lot of the uh, so-called Seminole reenactors are really not Seminole or even uh, American Indian in any way. But they really strive to make it as realistic as they possibly can. And that's what I try and do. I try and be as realistic as I possibly can. I try and portray that the common soldier really did not care about Indian removal in the way that the semi-aristocratic elites did. That's a very important point to get across. Even a lot of the officers did not support Indian removal. It was the fault of the plantation elite and the very upper classes of American society at the time who wanted this to happen. And they were using the army as the tool to get what they wanted, whether the army liked it or not. That's what I try and portray, that this was not an ideological conflict for the soldiers. I don't believe anybody possibly enlisted during this war and said, I'm enlisting because I want to fight for the cause. A lot of these were immigrants, and if you were an immigrant, it was easy to get a job in the Army, especially since they clothed you with whatever they had, they fed you even if it wasn't particularly good, and for the most part, you would have some form of roof over your head, or in most cases, a tent over your head. But you would be sheltered to some extent, you would be fed, you would be clothed, and you'd be paid a measly sum, and that's really all they wanted. They didn't join to fight for their country. They joined because they needed money, and there's nothing wrong with that. If you wanted to fight for your country and you were an average American of the time, why would you join the Army? You're already in your local militia. So I really do try and portray a soldier not as an ideological soldier, but as just someone who needed a job and ended up joining the Army. What kind of reactions have you gotten from your peers who think Marcus is dressing up to play Army? I do a virtual school, and I've been doing it for years, so I don't have too much of an opportunity to interact with most of my classmates, although a couple of them I've talked to, and they've found some interest in it, not too much. Nobody has really gotten too excited over it or wanted to join. But I have had several teachers who are very interested in it, because on a regular basis, I end up citing what I've done in reenactment, some of my school assignments, a snippet of what I do when I'm not in school. I had some very positive reactions from people towards that, and a lot of my relatives as well, they've become uh, interested in what I do and are always asking me to send them photos. What Seminole War living history events have you been to besides the Dade? I've been in a lot of small living history events. I've done that at the Pioneer Florida Museum, which is in Dade City. I've also been to a museum in Sanford run by Mr. Lloyd. Indeed, Bennett Lloyd. We've podcasted with him. He runs the Museum of Seminole County History in Sanford. Each year in February, they hold a living history encampment commemorating the Battle of Camp Monroe. This year, it's February 3rd and 4th. They promote black powder musket firings daily during it with other demonstrations. And the living historians there will tell why soldiers fought the Seminole over rivers, swamps, and savannas of Florida in the longest and most costly Indian war in U.S. history. A good time for all who are not being removed, forcibly for transport to Oklahoma. So I've done that there, and I've done Fort King, and I've done Dade Battle. Oh, yes, I've done Fort Cooper as well. I was on the artillery last year at Fort Cooper. This year's Fort Cooper Days are being held March 18th and 19th. They advertise it as an opportunity to experience Florida's history during the April 1836 skirmishes of the Second Seminole War. Attendees will see volunteers reenact an attack between a group of Seminoles and members of the 1st Georgia Battalion of Volunteers. You can find Fort Cooper at Inverness. What differences in approach have you noticed? At Dade Battle, where a lot of the interaction occurs, at other battles, it's really just standing in a line and uh, maybe falling over, sometimes helping someone injured. But Dade Battle is so scripted, and it's such an emotional event that it takes a lot of interaction. So for that, I'm usually not speaking. Usually Mr. Marshall does all the yelling back and forth. Uh, So usually what I ended up doing is I uh, help the injured, you know, 
Uh, one of us usually takes a hit, and I help him up and run him over where he needs to be. Also, you in their jackets before to show the faux bloody shirts and all that. But I do try and really get myself into character for that. I'm not a particularly good actor by any stretch, but I do try my hardest to really try and portray that raw fear that they would have felt during the day battle in 1835. How do living history events fit into your busy academic schedule? I balance it pretty well with my school. It's usually over weekends and I do virtual school so I can occasionally afford a weekday off to attend a small event. Um, as for my hobbies, I haven't found that it uh, interferes at all. I've actually combined my other hobbies with this in a sort of way. Like I've said before, I'm a voracious reader, but and this has allowed me to really focus my reading in a way I haven't before. Other times I'd just be taking books at random, learning unrelated facts about. Sometimes at most I'd focus on a particular battle that I wanted to learn about. But to me, this has been very interesting to really pinpoint what I want to learn, finding the books I want to read, finding the articles I want to read, and all that. I've researched some very interesting things that I had no idea about and n nobody had told me I've learned about the whole Seminole Wars. What kind of soldier training does Jesse Marshall present to the young soldier recruits? Well, as for training, it was mostly just uh, it's drill and history. That's what I learned before I actually started reenacting. Uh, you know, I would attend these small living histories, and I learned the drill, I learned the safety procedures. I've gotten very good at loading 12 times procedure. I would even say that I am better than most because I uh, end up practicing that very frequently at all these small living history events. I have to learn the history before I actually showed up. I had to at least have a basic idea of what was going on before I could participate, and I did that, and I... Uh, read all the books when I was supposed to. I paid a lot of attention to Dade's Last Command by Frank Lommer. So I started with learning about Dade Battle, and then I branched out from there with more general histories of the war. And uh, soon I'm hoping to start reading more about all three wars instead of focusing mostly on the Second Seminole War. Why is it so important that you present accurately as a soldier of that time period? Well, it's very important to be accurate. I think there is a common stereotype that a reenactor will know everything about a uniform. Then when you ask him about the geopolitical questions, he won't be able to answer them. And the reason that a lot of them focus on a uniform, I found out, is that's what you're going to be asked about the most. When people show up, you're wearing something that they've never seen before and they want to know about it. So what I do is I segue into the uniform questions into the more important information that they really should be knowing instead of just the uniform. But the uniform is important because it's so different looking. There's really nothing like it. Most people don't even know what we wore during the Mexican-American War, so they won't know about what we wore during the Seminole War, something that nobody has heard of. So people would go away with a very bad impression of what's going on here. They wouldn't understand. The worst part is most of them wouldn't be able to point it out because, like I said, nobody knows about this and not to point it out. If you see someone at a Civil War reenactment wearing a uh, World War II era helmet, most people would tell something's going wrong there. But here you can get away with just about anything because we, people don't have anything to base their knowledge on. So I always try and wear what's accurate. I don't mess around with other gear. Uh, really the only thing that I do that's not standard to the era is, well, technically it is standard. Sometimes I change my leather forage cap for the older model of forage cap because it just gets too hot to wear the leather one. But I always don my leather forage cap whenever I'm actually going into battle or expecting to talk to people because it's not too big of a deal if someone sees me just loafing around wearing a slightly older model of cap. I always explain when someone asks me, I say it's the older model that there is record of it being used past its technical expiration date, but then I go on to explain that it is technically on paper not the standard cap.
I've also gone the extra mile, and my grandfather and I, we made the dress uniform instead of just the blue fatigue dress that most everyone wears. And I wore that at uh, special ceremonies, and I had occasion at the 14 reenactment to wear that for sentry duty, which they most likely would have worn the dress coat on a sentry duty if the fort was well provided for. It wasn't just a bushwhacking fort made out of sticks and stones. You were wearing that uniform at the Dade Battle Commemoration, which is before the reenactment. It's every December 28th, because that's the date of the Dade Battle. That's correct. I always make a point to attend that, because I feel that's just as important as the Dade Battle, even though there aren't as many spectators, and most of the spectators themselves are part of the in-group, but I still feel it's important to attend that ceremony actually commemorating the lives lost on both sides. Who enforces this code of accuracy? Well, uh, generally, I would say for we all police ourselves to an extent. I don't really know of anyone that has gotten really crazy. There's one member of our squad who wears a whole assortment of things when the public's not around, but he shapes up when the public is around. If anyone on my squad, I believe that I am myself and Ethan, we are more or less corporals in a way of the squad. Uh, two corporals for a squad of about five. <laughs> That's uh, not really a corporal, but more or less we are the first youth reenactors, and hopefully it will grow and we will truly earn our position in the squad. So generally, if that happened, I would think that we would stop that. We generally try and correct any uniform malfunctions. We, the straps are very difficult to buckle, and especially when you've got a uh, leather neck stock on, keeping your head forward. So we try and uh, do that for each other. We'll point out if something's crooked, especially if we're going into battle. So we keep very good order amongst ourselves. I did see Jesse Marshall enforce the uniform code. Somebody had uniform pants, but the jacket was a civilian. So he said, you fight over with the militia, and thereby he preserved the integrity of the uniform for the soldiers. And that's why myself and Ethan, we spend a lot of time around him, and uh, we learn what we can. In fact, I'd say a lot of what I've learned just comes from sitting around Mr. Marshall, and uh, either he talks to us or he's talking to someone else. I just listen, and I uh, learn as he talks. Well, we had a somewhat humorous incident at the last day battle among the fourth squad. I was in my tent at the point. And I wasn't in my sleeping bag yet. I was very tired, but I was sitting there. And uh, long story short, I was trying to fix something that had messed up with a mosquito net, and that ended up not working. But I was sitting there trying to repair it the best I could. And I heard what the uh, rest of the youth squad were talking about in the large wall tent that was adjacent to mine. They were essentially talking about theoretical astrophysics and all sorts of dark matter and different particles. Myself and Mr. Marshall, we thought that was very funny the next morning talking about <laughs> what they were talking about, especially since a lot of them were a little bit younger than me. They were a little bit rowdy, but they were in the tent and they were discussing things beyond me. <laughs> Marcus, as you move on with your life, what are some takeaways from this living history impression? I can say for certain, if anybody asks me, I'll be able to tell them how to do Scott's tactics of 1835. <laughs> but beyond that, I would say that I do have a much better grasp of history than I had before. And I have that more importantly than just the pure fact. I gained that sort of mindset of always looking for something new to learn. And I think that's going to be really helpful as I go on into the future. It's also helped me uh, do something a little more technical. It's helped me learn some responsibility for the musket I have. It's not really difficult, but it's time-consuming, kind of a pain in the butt to clean, especially since I try and clean it as soon as possible after events. But I've learned a lot of responsibility and religiously cleaning it after every event and field cleaning it. If it's a two-day event, I field clean it on the afternoon. It's got to be done if you want to defend yourself. And I imagine that it was uh, orders to clean their musket. Same as it is in the modern military, the worst possible thing is a soldier sitting around doing nothing. You might as well be cleaning your musket. And if you're not cleaning it, you should be polishing it. 
I keep my musket not polished. I keep it at that aged look. But I did polish my bayonet because Mr. Marshall informed me that they did keep their bayonets polished just due to the psychological factor that a line of shining bayonets was expected to have among the enemy. I had no idea until I was told. Another new fact that I've learned, I've never read it even in my Napoleonic books. They've never mentioned anything about the effect of shining bayonets, but I can very easily see how that would have been done even in Florida. It's telling that the force that perished in the Dade battle was described as leaving Fort Brooke with a hundred bayonets, not a hundred rifles. And that tells you where the army thought the power of the force was really coming from. I recall seeing a living historian reenactor at Yorktown Battlefield in Virginia, and he said the bayonet, the ultimate weapon. That was its reputation. I can see how shining them so they glint in the sun would add to their intimidation factor. All right. Marcus, what's your plans for college, if that's a route you want to take after this? Well, I've applied to several colleges, so I expect to be going away for four years. I've applied to some in and out of state, and I hope even if I'm out of state, I'd be able to come down to Florida and do at least a day battle. Some of the colleges that I've applied to are very near to this area, so I wouldn't have any problem balancing my college life with my reenactment. The real question is what happens after that? One of the plans I currently have is to take ROTC while I'm in college, Navy ROTC. So that may be a little more difficult to balance reenactment with a career in the Navy, but I haven't 100% decided on that yet. So that's uh, definitely an open question for me. I plan to get an engineering degree I decided against getting uh, any kind of history degree. I decided it would be better to keep my hobby and my passion away from my work. I'm very good at math. I would say I'm proficient, not an expert, but I'm proficient enough to make a career out of it. I do believe, though, that uh, knowledge of Seminole Wars is going to help me academically simply because it's, it's just so interesting. Even when the layman reads about it, I tell them about it, and they'll be interested. It's something that's really special to Florida. As we wrap up, Marcus, what would you like to add that we didn't discuss today? I would add that if anybody is just getting into this, especially if they're young, but even if they're older, just go ahead and try and join. I joined and I really enjoyed the experience. and I'm very glad that I joined. It's definitely been the most interesting thing I've done, recent or long-term memory. And I hope to keep it up in some form for a very long time. You can just come by and watch it and talk to us. And if you don't like it, you don't like it. That's fine. I know some of our guys, they've came and they've watched before. And they're just now getting involved. And uh, they seem to enjoy it, too. So how can they do it? How can they get involved in this hobby? Well, there's numerous ways to do it. Uh, I did it by contacting the park rangers, but they put me in charge with uh, Mr. Archie Marshall. So I figure uh, anyone who wants to get involved at some point is going to come across Mr. Archie Marshall. We'll have to leave it there. Marcus Acosta, thanks for joining us for the Seminole Wars Authority. Thank you. Nice talking with you. This podcast is copyright 2023. The Seminole Wars Foundation, all rights reserved. Find us on the web at seminolewars.podbean.com or seminolewars.us. Front and back bumper music courtesy of the U.S. Navy Band.